Okay, let's start then again. Welcome back after break. Uh, my name is Tomasz Sobański. I'm working here in ECA in the Computational Assessment and Dissemination Unit, and I'm project manager of the uh, OECD QSAR toolbox. And together with my colleagues, Marta San Nicola and Andrea Gisi, we'll try to show you the share with you the basic information about the QSAR toolbox and the, what can, how it can be used and what are the functionalities which might be useful for you once you are preparing your registration. But before I will start, okay, we have still some people approaching, but anyway, I think I can already continue. Before I will start, I, I have a few questions for you. Uh, first one is how many of you hear about the QSAR toolbox before this event? Okay, yeah, some of, yeah, that's a good sign. How many of you have been using it? Okay. How many of you found it uh, easy to use? Okay, that's, <laughs> thank you very much. That was, <laughs> exactly. So um, I'm, I'm not promising you that now from version 4.0, everything will be completely different and will be super easy and you will do, that it will do all the magic for you, but we tried to do our best to make it more user-friendly and, and, and a bit as well more guide you towards the data, uh, data gap filling process in the regulatory hazard assessment. In front of you, uh, in front of you, you should find the QSAR toolbox leaflet when we put some basic information so on the one side of the of this of this leaflet, you will find some basic information about the basic features of the new QSAR toolbox. So what are the new things for those which know that already the tool? And on the other side, there is more information about basic functionalities and some basic vocabulary, what what is what in the QSAR toolbox. So please take it with you. It will be your reference. Of course, all those training materials are as well available on our website. We'll show you at the end of the presentation where to find interesting and useful information. So here is an outline of my presentation. We'll, you've heard it already um, at the mor uh, this morning, but I will try to give you very brief regulatory context for using, uh, specifically using the QSARs. Then I will introduce you to the QSAR toolbox uh, project. And then my colleagues will uh, guide you through. First, Marta will show you the tool itself, its basic elements, and he, uh, trying to explain what are elements for and how you can use them. And then Andrea will try to show you the live demo, how, uh, for example, prediction can be done for some endpoint. And then I will tr uh, conclude and try to sh as well show you some useful information, how you can find the feather, feather references or feather more useful information later. So, regulatory context. So, uh, as you know, animal testing is the last resort on the reach, so you should consider all possible information before you are deciding or going for, for the tests. And this is what we are trying to facilitate uh, with our tool. Uh, you know as well that uh, uh, using of alternatives should be done without compromising the level of protection, level of safety for human health environment. So we can use alternatives, but the amount of information and the quality of information should be more or less at the same level as you as I would, you would uh, perform the normal standard test. Then uh, regarding the QSRs, the main mm, Conditions are set in Annex 11 of REACH in uh, Section 1.3. I will join, show you in the f next slide this. And I think you will hear it quite often in this presentation, uh, keyword transparency. Transparency is for us quite important because we believe that uh, when you are doing transparent prediction and you are uh, transparently reporting it to us, it will be much easier to follow it, to check how you came to your conclusions, and then to conclude on the compliance. So for us, this is really key factor for regulatory acceptance. And that's why we as well investing in developing the QSAR toolbox, because we believe this is the tool which brings transparency, both within the data and the way how you are grouping them together and how you are making your prediction. So, as I mentioned, Annex 11 of REACH, Section 1.3, puts all the requirements for QSARs. 
So the first is that results needs to be delivered from the QSAR, which is scientifically valid. What it means scientifically valid, I will show you in the next slide. The substance, the substance for which you are using your model needs to fall into the applicable domain in this model, which means that this model should be suitable to be being able to properly predict your substance. This is something which your tool is able to, to deal with. Uh, then results should be adequate for purpose of classification and labeling and for risk assessment. This means that, for example, if we have a standard requirement, which is uh, skin sensitization, which should allow us a classification, we should conclude on whether it is sensitizer or not. And if it is, which, what is the class of, uh, of, of sensitizer? We should be able to deliver those information based on your prediction, do it as well. So please keep it in mind that it is not enough to say that some substance is positive or negative. We need to know if it is positive, what is the class of hazard class and this is quite important in terms of what kind of data is backing your your prediction and of course a, a pro proper documentation should be available so because we need to find out whether first we need to be able to assess validity of the model and then we need to see as well if model was properly applied for your substance that's why documentation is needed and then for validity of the model those are the five OECD principles for validation of the QSARs. We we applying them as well in ECA. We stick to them. So basically, model is valid when it has a defined endpoint, and this is very important, especially in the rich context. When we are talking about a defined endpoint, this defined endpoint should be compatible with those which is in the standard information requirements. So if we are talking about AMS mutagenicity, we are talking about mut AMS mutagenicity, not mutagenicity in general, like some QSARs does do. Uh, algorithm shouldn't be super complex because we would like to follow <laughs> how the prediction was delivered. So we don't want necessarily to, to, to see very complex fuzzy logic based assumption because basically those, those algorithms very often are very strongly rely on, the, on, the, on, the, on your training set. And it is not always easy to predict how it will behave for the chemicals which are a bit further from the training set of this, of this model. Um, then define domain of applicability. It, it is exactly, it's a bit linked to the second requirement. If, if, you, if you know how you build your model and what is reasoning behind your model, probably you know as well your limitation of your model. And this is, you need to be aware of what are the limitations of your model. There is no single QSR which works for whole chemical universe. They will, you will have always some specificity, so always some specific chemical spaces which will perform the, the different QSARs will perform differently and this is very important to know what are the limitations of your model and whether or not your substance can be predicted with this model and then and this basically links us to the already requirement number four because you need to be able to assess whether or not I predicted well and and then at the end mechanistic interpretation if possible is very welcome because this as, as well gives us the, the confidence that you took into account as well something which is related to mechanism of toxicity it's not purely statistical model which strongly depends on your training set but you took into account some mechanistic uh, considerations which are relevant for your endpoint and this is something which we are trying to as well up apply in the QSAR toolbox so now just to give you a few a short background of, on the QSAR Toolbox project, how it started and why. So uh, QSAR Toolbox is the co-owned product by OECD and ECA. We are both owning this project and we are co-managing it together. Uh, in this um, Everything which is in the, which is, has been implemented into the toolbox went through the pre-review process of OECD member states, which are working under the management group of the QSAR toolbox. So everything which we are trying to implement, all the new features are always first discussed with a member states expert, and then only after they approval they are officially released within the tool. So you can have a bit, to some extent, assurance that what we are giving you as a tool is something which was already discussed both in the scientific and regulatory context. And then, of course, this system is freely available and you can download it uh, from our website, which is, which is www.qsartoolbox.org. And that's it. Here you have a list of the supporting institutions. As you see, a lot of member states, different uh, um, 
competent authorities, together with scientific organizations and industry, who are actively supporting the tool by donating the knowledge, by donating the data, and by donating the experience what is needed. So, as you see, there is as well a lot of industrial partners which are trying to, 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 to drive us in the direction how this tool may be, can be more useful for you. And then, how it started. The, the, the problem was that we, we've been struggling with the QSAR started in the 60s. The, the there was the first area of big excitement that QSARs can self save almost all the problems. People were very happy. They start to make first predictions, especially for physical properties, fate properties. There was a big enthusiasm. And there was a big hope that we can, with this approach, can sa save a lot of animals and save a lot of troubles for the future for everything, including higher tier endpoints. Everything can be predicted using QSARs. Very quickly, we realized that although it wor works quite well for physical properties, for many um, properties which are directly drive by structures of, of chemistry, it not necessarily work always very well for more complex endpoints when structure is as well processed by the organism and then you, you, it's very hard to, to, to foresee what will be the final or if it will be adverse outcome and what kind of adverse outcome we'll see. So this leads us to the problem, okay, most probably we cannot predict everything but how we can indicate transparently and in the transparent manner what we can predict. And then classical QSARs we had a uh, problem with that because it's not so, normally the classical QSAR model will always give you an answer. Whether it's a proper one or not, you will always get some number. You are, as long as you know what is your structure, you will get some number. You have, of course, some indications whether or not this number can be trusted, but this, with the, this was a problem. So. And, and, and then we've been struggling as a regulators with accepting this because we never knew. We knew, okay, the basic uh, developers were saying that those tools are pr predicting, for example, in 85% of cases properly our, uh, our um, property. But we've never been sure whether my case on my desk is within this 85% or with this 15% and we need to conclude on, on hazard assessment. So we need to decide on something. And that's why when this was the moment when uh, the, the, the people behind the toolbox start to think, okay, how to find a way to, to build a transparent still facilitate the predictions, but do it in the transparent manner, that you can see step by step what has been done and how it has been done, and you are able even to review the, the data behind your prediction. And this is how toolbox started. And just to show you, so one of the, the, the fathers of, of Toolbox was Gil White. He was a, a very recognized uh, QSAR expert from US EPA. He started with this concept of transparent QSARs that we are building transparent data matrix. We are trying to build your own customized QSARs based on uh, knowledge and understanding of the property which you want to predict. Then colleagues from OECD, Bob Dietrich here, was trying to to see how this could be used in the regulatory context, how we can then turn this concept into something which could be used and ap ap applied. And then there was a lot of discussions. So those are all those pictures I think are from 2006, when there were a lot of discussions, okay, how those concepts, those ideas which are on the whiteboard convert into the software tool. And this was the first QSAR Toolbox pr proof of concept version 1.0 released, I think, in 2008. So that, w that was, it's, some elements you will find still in the newest version, but it was this, the, the, the beginning. So, and although QSAR toolbox is not the easiest tool to use, as, as you acknowledge yourself, those which know the toolbox, it seems that more and more people appreciate the, the, the way how we are thinking that uh, predictions could be done and uh, uh, hazard, the starting point for hazard assessment can be done because we, we see still constant grow of the use of the toolbox and we see more and more users. So now we started in 2012 to register our users to know some basic facts about them. And we started with 2000 users, registered users. Now we, last year already, we, we crossed the number of 10,000 users, so. And I think that's it, I guess. So I will now uh, give floor to Marta. She will try to present you the basic elements of the toolbox and how you can use them and what you can use them. Thank you. Marta, please.
Good morning. Welcome to our IT tool training. Today I'm going to introduce you a little bit the QSR toolbox, what are the main functions, the core functions, and what's more, what are the new functions that we can find in version 4.0. So let's move to the agenda. My presentation will consist of two parts. So we will have a general introduction, and then we, we are going to um, see all the different sections of the software, and I will explain uh, the details of each section. So what are the activities that we can use the toolbox for? What can we use the toolbox for? As you all know, it is a data gap filling uh, software, but this is not the only activity that we can use the toolbox for. So here you can read predictions and much more. So here we have a short list of possible things that we can do with the toolbox. For example, we can use it for searching for available experimental data. We can use the toolbox also to profile a chemical, so to define a chemical and uh, identify the um, specific char characteristics of a chemical. Then we can also create groups. So having an input chemical, we can, we can create a, a category around this input chemical. We can also use the toolbox to simulate metabolites. And last but not least, we can also make predictions and fill data gaps. So I think that this sentence here uh, summarizes a little bit the essence of the software. So it collects and applies knowledge on chemicals. And what's more is that now we have a completely new version, so updated and renewed, uh, ready to use. When we talk about the toolbox, we most of the times use uh, recurrent terms and probably not all of you are so familiar with these uh, terms. So the first definition here is very intuitive. So what is a target chemical? Is the chemical of our interest. So a chemical on which we are focusing our work on. What is a module? A module is a toolbox uh, section where we can find different specific options and uh, a module we can use to uh, perform specific action in, in the software. What is the workflow? The workflow is the use in combination of these different modules. And we will see, uh, my colleague will uh, show you example of, uh, examples of possible workflows. Then we have a profilers. So profiler is a key concept in the toolbox. It is basically an algorithm, uh, let's say a rule set for the identification of specific features, specific characteristics of uh, our chemicals. We have different types of profilers, different groups, but most of the times we will use structural or uh, mechanistic profilers. Then the category, so basically a group of substances. We have an, uh, an input chemical, and around this input chemical, we, we will create a category of similar substances according to profilers. And then we have the endpoint tree, which is basically this branched scheme in which the endpoints are organized and structured. And then the data matrix, which is this tab that reports all the chemical structures that we retrieved, all the data, and all the values. So let's move more concretely, concretely to the software. Let's see the interface, what it looks like, and where these mail elements that I mentioned before are placed. So here we can see in this upper part the modules. They are six, so input, profiling, data, category defini definition, data gap filling, and report. Uh, here you can see these modules in a specific order, but this doesn't necessarily mean that you have to use them in this order or that you have to use all of them. And this aspect, please keep this in mind because my colleague will show you uh, this uh, more, um, more concretely. Then we have the documentary, and here uh, you can um, read basically a list of all the of all the actions that you performed in the software. You can browse through them, you can go back and, f and forth um, in the actions, and you can also change a um, little bit of details. Then here you can see the profilers, so the list of the available profilers. And as I explained before, they are these algorithms according to what you can define and identify uh, characteristics of your chemical. And when applying a profiler, after that you will see the outcome of the profiler in the corresponding cell in the data matrix as shown here. 
Here we have the endpoint tree, which is the central area, gray area in the interface. So this branch scheme that reports uh, all the endpoints and organizes all the endpoints. And then the data matrix. So this tab that shows all the chemical structures, profilers outcome, uh, data, and also uh, values. What's more is that in this new version of the toolbox, you will have the chance also to export this data matrix in an Excel format and then use it for several purposes. So let's explore now each of these sections. And um, so I will talk about the core functions and but also um, the new features uh, that you will find in version 4.0. So the first section is the input one. So here, basically, you have to say, to tell the software on which um, chemical you're going to work. Uh, you can work on just one chemical or to a list, or to, um, you can work on more chemicals. So if you just want to work uh, on a single chemical, you have several options here. You can type the cast number, you can write the name, you can draw the structure or type the smiles. And here you see all these buttons shown here in this action bar. If you want to select chemicals from a list, you can push on uh, the, the buttons there, and you can select so chemicals from a list, from a database, or from an inventory. Another interesting function here is the query tool. So here, basically, you can retrieve chemicals from selected databases according to specific criteria. For example, you can retrieve all those chemicals that share uh, a common subfragment, and this could be really useful, in my opinion. Then here, uh, this is a new uh, thing that you will find in the version 4.0. So for those of you that have been using the toolbox before, we'll immediately notice the difference. So here we have a completely renewed drawing tool. It is more, uh, it is easier to use, in my opinion, and is more intuitive. And in case you will use the toolbox, you, you can uh, then form your opinion in, uh, about this. And then here we have a big uh, additional uh, feature. So at this point in the input phase, you can also define your target endpoint. And it was, this was not possible uh, in the previous versions. So here you just click on the button that you see here, and you will see this window pop up. You here can select your uh, endpoint. Then you can also refine your choice, so you can add metadata. So for example, you can choose uh, the target organ or the duration. And then you will see the corresponding cell uh, highlighted in blue in the data matrix, and also the whole row will become yellow. Uh, so in case you select the target endpoint in this step, you will also see the um, profilers and databases that will be colored in, uh, in, in the following sections. In case you don't want to select the target endpoint in this phase, you can always do this afterwards, so just by clicking on the right cell in the data matrix. So here we have the second section, the profiling section, and here you, ha you can choose the profilers to uh, identify and define uh, the main characteristics of your chemicals. Uh, we have different groups of profilers, so we have mm, this predefined, general mechanicistic, end endpoint specific, and empiric ones. Uh, most of the times we use mechanicistic or uh, structural profilers. And after applying them, you will see the outcome in the data matrix. Um, maybe you, you can get lost and you, you can say, what kind of profilers should I select? So now, in the new version of the, of the toolbox, uh, the toolbox will help you. So this is a big improvement and a big help for uh, the users, I think. So you will see green profilers if they are suitable for your target endpoint. And these are those profilers that have been developed using the data for the endpoint of interest. Then you will see also orange profilers, and those are plausible. So they are developed using data somehow related to the endpoint of interest. And then those that are not highlighted, they are just unclassified, so developed using data not really relevant or re related to the endpoint of interest. Then, in this new version, we have also updated profilers. And what's more, we have also uh, the possibility to retrieve at this step also uh, available experimental uh, quantitative data about metabolites. 
And if you may have uh, questions about how to deal with the toolbox and metabolism, please ask uh, after the presentations. Then we have the data section. And here you will see a list of available databases and available inventories. So here you just um, select databases and gather uh, the available experimental data for your chemical of interest. And once again, the toolbox will help you in choosing uh, the relevant databases for your target endpoint. So here you will see green databases for those databases that have data for the target endpoint, and the other ones will, are not highlighted because they don't have likely data for your target endpoint. Then you can have also a quick overview on the database content. So you can access to further information about the database. You have here an example. So basically, we have this reliability scores and database statistics. And you can know, for example, how much of the data have CAS numbers, how much of this data have CAS numbers related to SMILES. And also, you can know something about the year of publication of this data. Then here, we can see a little bit of, nu of numbers. And you can see how impressive are these numbers. So in the toolbox, now are stored more than 2 million uh, data points for more than 79,000 chemicals. So uh, this is quite impressive. And you can think about the toolbox as a tool to explore um, databases and available data for chemicals. Then we have the category definition. And here you will concretely create your group of chemicals. So starting from your input chemical that you input in the input phase, you will retrieve analogs. And this is possible according to profiler's outcome. So once again, here you have to choose your profiler and create this category. So once again, the toolbox will suggest you the profiler, the most suitable one, to create your category. And here, what's more is that we have this expanded, extended function. So you can also create a category taking into account metabolic transformation. And once again, if you have questions, then we can explain this more in details. Then finally, we have the data gap filling section. So here you will obtain concretely your prediction in case you are using the toolbox to perform a, wor a prediction workflow. So here you have always these three approaches. So the read across, you can obtain a prediction using data uh, of the closest analogs in your category. Trend analysis, you will obtain an equation that uh, expresses uh, the trend between a selected parameter, which is by default in the, to in the toolbox, the log uh, UW, and your target chemical. And then uh, you have also the possibility to use QSOR models, and um, basically uh, it's episode models. But you have this um, external library of QSORs. So here we have uh, a big um, change. I mean, um, in the previous versions of the toolbox, you could perform uh, a workflow just manually without any support by the software. While in this new version, you have the possibility to be supported and helped concretely by the, the software. So he, he, uh, basically, if you want to um, obtain a prediction, you can choose between these three options. You can just go uh, through this manual prediction, or you can choose between standardized workflow or automated workflow. And this will be shown by my colleague after. Once again, you know, the toolbox will suggest you the profiler to refine your category and remove those analogs that are not so uh, helpful in your category. And then finally, you have the report. So here you will obtain uh, the report, and you can also uh, modify it and comment the results and add your interpretations. So here you, you can see this wizard pages to customize your report. You can choose which sections you want to include and in, what, in which order. And then here you see a screenshot of the report. And you can see that is pretty simple and readable and straightforward and I think easier than it was uh, before. And finally, this is an example of exportable data metrics in an Excel format. Um, so basically, everything that was visible in the data matrix in the toolbox interface is now exportable in this uh, format. So this was my last slide.
thank you thank, thank you for listening and I will give the floor to my colleague Good morning. I'm uh, Andrea Gissi. I'm going uh, to show you in practice how to use the QSR toolbox. You now probably are looking forward to see the tool in practice. Just five more minutes of patience. I want to show you a few slides to introduce what we are going to see uh, on the screen uh, now. So um, first of all, for the installation, uh, there is a manual to install the toolbox. You need to install a database, the toolbox itself, and then Metapad. So, Please read the manual while doing the installation. What can you do um, with the toolbox? Mm, making a prediction uh, is something that you can do by using uh, all the modules in the toolbox. We know that the toolbox can be very useful also to perform uh, uh, operations that are uh, simpler to, to be done. And uh, we will see on the screen how to do the profiling and export the results, how to predict metabolites and export the results, how to get uh, data out of the toolbox, how to create a category. And then for the prediction, I'm not going to demonstrate the whole uh, workflow, but to show you one of these uh, two, two new options that uh, Marta has just uh, introduced. And in particular, we will see the standardized uh, workflow. Very quickly, what uh, is uh, mm, what can you do with this uh, uh, simple operation? With the, uh, the profiling, you can get a summary of the relevant properties of uh, your substance. The toolbox with color codes is also indicating you alerts. And these profilers are used to, um, as criteria to find the analogs, but they can also be very useful for a preliminary screening uh, or prioritization of substances. Indeed, this is the, also one of the uses we have in ECA of the toolbox. Then uh, you can also simulate uh, metabolites and export the structure for further uh, considerations. And uh, this is important because uh, metabolites and transformation products are uh, sometimes the driver of the uh, toxicity. You can also export uh, data from uh, the toolbox and uh, uh, we include as many details as they are available to us. And um, this is also very important uh, in the moment you are performing a prediction to be able to check the reference of the data, tra uh, track back the source to really decide whether this data is reliable or not, and you can base your prediction on that. Then in the uh, category formation, you can find uh, analogs that are related uh, to your substance. Um, you will use profilers to find these analogs. Uh, therefore, the analogs uh, will, can be based uh, not only on the structural similarity, but also on a mechanistic uh, similarity. And once you find analogs, you can find uh, the um, related experimental data. And therefore, uh, visually, it will be quite simple to identify data gaps and then uh, fill them with the toolbox or uh, outside the toolbox. Finally, uh, the prediction. As I told you in, in the beginning, uh, normally to do a prediction, you run all the modules of the toolbox uh, in a sequence. What is uh, new in the version 4 of the toolbox is that you can jump from input to data gap filling, choose the endpoint, run the prediction, and then uh, decide whether uh, uh, the prediction uh, is uh, uh, acceptable or not. In case the toolbox can preliminary identify uh, concern with the prediction, it's not going to give a prediction to you. But even when the you, can, you, you obtain a prediction with the, the automated or manual workflow or um, standardized workflow, it's very important that you double check the content and uh, eventually add the justification on why this uh, prediction can really be uh, trusted. So um, maybe to clarify the terms, what is the difference between the automatic and the standardized uh, workflow? In the automated uh, workflow, you put your input chemical, select your endpoint, click on the prediction, you get a prediction if possible, otherwise the toolbox warns you that uh, is, uh, a suitable prediction cannot be done. Automated workflow, I think, is quite um, intuitive to understand. What about the standardized? In the standardized workflow, uh, there is a wizard uh, guiding you through the different uh, steps of uh, the prediction. So it's going, uh, the toolbox is going uh, to pre-filter the information for you, but then among uh, suitable choices, you are still the one choosing whether uh, to go for one profiler or another, to choose a database or another. 
and uh, this is a bit halfway between the automated workflow and the manual prediction. That is what has always been available in the toolbox where it's all up to you. But uh, in that case, uh, we still uh, see a benefit for the um, more expert users to be able uh, to activate this uh, color coding of the profilers and of the data so that you can see in green or in orange what is probably going to be a suitable option for you. Um, here we put together a few uh, links that uh, you can use to find uh, the material about uh, the uh, toolbox, uh, new and also older material. Um, ECA website, uh, there uh, um, we published uh, what we call illustrative examples. This is, uh, these documents uh, um, explain what we in ECA think has to be taken into account when uh, doing a prediction with the toolbox. They do not focus too much on where to click, what to do. They more explain the reasoning behind the toolbox, uh, prediction and uh, what to take into account. In the QSR toolbox uh, website, you find the download file, you also find the documentation, and you find tutorials. So Toolbox website is the um, departure point. You download the tool, you learn how to use it through the tutorials, and then when you are ready, you go to our illustrative examples and understand also the, the, the reasoning behind certain choices. Then uh, there are also some uh, upcoming trainings on the toolbox. Uh, so far, uh, uh, we have uh, planned one webinar that will be held by uh, Chemical Watch, uh, and uh, this is scheduled for the end of April. But uh, also, uh, together with OACD, we are planning uh, in the next months also to organize one or two additional webinars with the technical uh, explanation of uh, um, most of the modules of uh, the toolbox. And then there are also some uh, other external uh, commercial training, and uh, one of these is going to be in uh, June. And uh, also for this training, uh, you find uh, a reference uh, here. So now it's finally time to see for the first time the toolbox version 4.0. I'm going to open it on the screen and uh, show you some uh, simple operation that uh, can be done. Those who are familiar with Toolbox 3.4, here uh, will not see too many changes except of uh, some new buttons, and I will explain a few of them. This is the input module, and uh, I'm going to input a substance by cast number. Now, this is always a difficult choice because people then wonder why ESEC has selected this substance and not another one. Are they interested to this substance? Here I'm taking one substance that is it's just suitable to show you on, on the screen. There is no particular interest uh, on this substance. Here, when I put a cast number, I find uh, two results. And um, the toolbox is telling me uh, the quality of uh, the uh, relationship between the cast number and the structure. They are both high quality. So if I click OK, we can see what has happened. Why do we have two substances? And there we will discover one of the uh, new things in the QSR Toolbox 4.0. Data coming from uh, rich registration and substances coming from rich registration are now separated from substances available in the other databases. Uh, the reason is that uh, now the toolbox uh, has an entry to discuss the substance type. And uh, in uh, the, this case, this substance has been registered as monoconstituent, while uh, most of the other databases do not really account for this uh, composition or type of uh, substance. So for all the substances in the other databases, it will uh, say that uh, it's uh, unspecified. And for the substances uh, from ECACAM, it uh, will uh, speak about the, the substance type. Here, uh, the reason to have uh, this uh, separation is that uh, we uh, want to develop the toolbox further in the direction of handling uh, composition and so on. And this is the first step uh, towards uh, there. Of course, uh, data coming from uh, different uh, type of substances and composition can be different exactly because of these different components. So already to have this data separate, it's a first step towards uh, taking the composition uh, into account. So at this point, before showing you the definition of the target endpoint, I want to show you a few more new things. One is that uh, if I now go to the profiling module, let's say 
let's start from the profiling. I select all the available profilers. I can close the document tree so that you can see a little bit bigger. Here, when you have only one or few chemicals in the data matrix, there is not a specific reason to limit your choice of profilers because the toolbox calculation is going to be quite fast. So now I'm going to apply all the profilers to the target chemical. And now you can see that here it says color by endpoint selected in the data matrix. What does this mean? It means that uh, if I click on um, some uh, some profiler, I can um, I can see which ones are those that are relevant to uh, an endpoint. And we will see this when I uh, select the uh, target endpoint. And uh, the same is uh, applicable to um, to the data. Again, for few substances, there is no reason to limit the selection of uh, databases. You can just select them all and uh, gather uh, the data. And here we see that there are 29 data points for these uh, two chemicals. Uh, as I explained in uh, in the beginning, uh, we believe that uh, extracting the information, even just the for the profiling or for the available experimental data is already something that can be useful to the user. You don't have to go necessarily to, to a prediction. And uh, how can you export this uh, data? This functionality was uh, partially available already before when uh, you are on uh, the endpoint tree and uh, you uh, right click. Then there is this export data matrix. You can select what you want to export among the profilers or among the experimental data. And then this data will come out as a CSV format. Now, uh, Marta has shown you before a very nice uh, data matrix in Excel where you can see the structures, the parameters. And uh, those of you who have done a read across also outside the toolbox, they know how time consuming is this uh, operation. So in this version that we have released a few hours ago, you can export the data matrix only once uh, you have uh, uh, completed a prediction. This means that uh, my advice is that if you really don't want to get to a prediction and still want a data matrix, just run a very quick prediction to be able to, uh, to export a data matrix. This uh, technical limitation uh, will be removed uh, in, the, in the next version, but at the moment the data matrix is seen as a report and therefore reports can only be generated uh, once uh, you, you, you have uh, created uh, a prediction. But uh, I know that can be done quite quickly. So um, I wanted to show you what happens when you define a target uh, endpoint. So input, define target endpoint. Then uh, you get a pop-up uh, window, which shows you at a high level which endpoint uh, you can select. This is just a repetition of what you will see normally in the endpoint tree in the middle of the toolbox screen. And for this example, I want to show you what happens if you select uh, aquatic toxicity and then try to do some fish toxicity example. So um, I go to Ecotox, aquatic toxicity, click on next. Now I have to define exactly what endpoint I want to work on and I will select LC50 and then I pick it and let's say that I want to limit it uh, to fish and maybe to a specific uh, fish species that has, uh, uh, is uh, relevant uh, for uh, um, OECD test guidelines. Then I would uh, add uh, um, test organism species, then I click add and then I can type which species I want. And we know that for uh, uh, Pimepales promelias, this is one fish species that is recommended by OECD. There is plenty of data on this species, so it's, it's, it's a good species to uh, select. Then I click Finish. What happens is that uh, now I have the profiling open. But uh, basically the row of LC50 Pimepales promelas is now yellow. So uh, this is uh, the, the part of the data matrix I want to work on. Now, when I click here and I go to uh, profiling, we see what uh, Marta has just explained before. 
and there is also a legend for those who don't remember. There are some profilers which are called or colored in green and called suitable, some profilers which are orange and called plausible, and uh, some others that just do not uh, have any color. Uh, the main difference between suitable and uh, plausible profilers, uh, well, uh, uh, we always say that the structural similarity is important when creating a category or to make a read across. So those profilers that are uh, directly linked to structure, they are usually orange. And then if there is some profiler that is uh, specific for the toxicity or developed with data specific for this toxicity, then they appear uh, in, uh, in green. Here you can see all the aquatic toxicity, also this uh, USCP in, uh, new chemical categories that's uh, considered uh, uh, to be um, a suitable profiler. Same happens uh, when we go to the databases. If we click data, and then we see that ECACAN contains data, and then ECOTOX database contains data on uh, uh, this toxicity, also aquatic uh, oasis uh, and the ECOTOX. So um, another function, it can be quite handy that, okay, you started with fish toxicity, then you change your mind, and you want to jump on something else. Let's say, um, let's see what we have here, sensitization, for example, where you click on sensitization. If uh, we go back to the profiling and we say color by not any more target endpoint, but endpoint selected in the data matrix, then uh, the color will change according to what is uh, selected uh, in, uh, in the data matrix. And then you can uh, quickly browse through the, the different options. So now if we go back to the fish, we have done the data. Now, if you want to run a normal workflow, you will just go to category definition, uh, and then you will be able to define your category according to one of the relevant profilers and so on. I don't want to show this. I want to show you the new workflows. So imagine from the input, you have put a structure. You don't need to go through any of this intermediate step. You just go to data gap filling. If you haven't done anything, you are probably in a situation where you're still selecting your structure, let's say. There are these two new buttons. These two new buttons, standardized and automated workflow. Automated workflow has a more limited uh, choice of endpoints. Now, now they are almost comparable, but there is a little bit more in standardized. Basically, you can choose between Ecotox, and then in Ecotox, you find uh, in the automated only fish toxicity. We will see that in the standardized, there is also Daphne and algae toxicity for different species. And then uh, in uh, the um, human health, you just have uh, skin sensitization. The plan is to add more if this functionality is appreciated. I want to show you the standardized workflow. And uh, I will do it uh, for fish toxicity. Here uh, I can choose among five options. Basically, the difference between this option, we have two fish, one uh, invertebrates, daphnids, and uh, two algae. For the two fish, we can either use one specific fish species, and we always recommend to start with one specific fish species, see if you have enough data. If you don't, then use all the fish species put uh, together. But uh, you get a higher accuracy if you refine your category and your data uh, based on one fish species. So I'm going to select the first option. It tells me that if I'm working on some other endpoint, it will be overwritten and the target endpoint will become the the, um, the one that I have just selected in the standardized workflow. Now, uh, this uh, option can be run in batch. Now I have two structures, so the toolbox is telling me I will do it from stru stru uh, structure one to structure two. No, I just want to do it from one structure because they are the same structure. And then I put from one to one and click OK. Now, um, as we said before, uh, this is a wizard that is helping you in the prediction. So from the input, you put the structure. Now you have decided the endpoint. Now the toolbox is asking me to choose uh, the databases uh, to be used. To be faster, I'm going to select only the first database, Aquatic Oasis. And here the choices you, you see are only among the databases that anyway contain uh, aquatic toxicity data. So the toolbox is pre-filtering for you what he knows that is uh, not relevant. If you are doing this at home and you have time, you probably want to select all the available databases here. To make it faster, I'm going to select only the, the first one. Then when I click, 
then uh, the standardized workflow is uh, is starting so the toolbox uh, um, is finding uh, from the databases i have selected all the analogs based on uh, the different uh, profilers yes is trying all of them to see which one is giving uh, the best uh, results and they are uh, is telling me the outcome of this very quick search that he has done so what uh, we read is that if uh, we use the profiler uh, acute aquatic toxicity to find analogs in the database we have just selected, we will have 916 analogs, of which uh, 218 will have uh, data points, and uh, in total there will be 283 data points. It means that for two chemicals there are two data. Then if we will use uh, this other profiler, aquatic toxicity by ECOSAR, there will be 700 analogs. If you use the US EPA, then we find uh, 370. And if we use the organic functional groups, different numbers. So once again, what the toolbox has done, has run whatever it thinks is plausible. Then it's telling us what will happen when we make the choice, but it's still up to us to make this choice. Usually when uh, we do examples in ECA, we always say, okay, let's start from a structural profiler because we want structural uh, similarity, and then let's confirm that these analogs are uh, relevant by using some mechanistic profiler to take out all that is not relevant for that specific endpoint. So a structural profiler, I'm going to use, I could take the organic functional group or US EPA new chemical categories. I click OK. Now, again, the, the toolbox will start uh, work on its own. Uh, he has found the analogs that I mentioned before, but then it starts to remove those chemicals that are tested above the water solubility and the other chemicals that may have uh, other points. And then uh, he's uh, telling us the outcome. He's saying that uh, the current uh, situation or state already satisfies the criteria for acceptance of the prediction. Would you like to accept the prediction? I would say no, because it's, it's a big category. There are some um, chemicals that are fall, uh, clearly outside the trend. So I will tell him, no, let's continue with the standardized workflow and let's go um, to refine the category. Now the toolbox is, uh, again, applying all the plausible profilers, and then it's telling me in green what is, will be a good profiler to use, and in yellow what is a profiler that doesn't change much, and then if there are bad profilers, they are even highlighted in uh, red. So um, what I can see here is that there are a few profilers that can indeed improve uh, the uh, prediction, and for each profiler that I can eventually use, it's telling me what will be the R square of the regression and what will be the um, average error for the prediction when I apply that to profiler. Now, again, just to show you an example, I'm going to show you uh, the selection of one mechanistic profiler. Then the toolbox is going to find the analogs that are uh, um, analogs also according to this profiler. It got even better. It's still telling me that the current state satisfies the criteria for acceptance of the prediction. Would you like to accept the prediction? Now, since this is a demonstration, we want to show a really nice trend. I will click no and uh, refine for the last time the prediction to get the perfect trend, which unfortunately is not always the case, but at least for some simple cases uh, that works. In other cases, you may want to stay with clear, uh, trends that are uh, maybe uh, bit less uh, specific. So now I click on continue. And I will tell him, uh, I can already see that there are analogs that have nothing to do with my target uh, chemical. So I want uh, analogs that share the same organic functional groups. And I can see that there will be 15 analogs left with an R square of uh, uh, 0 0.991 and a very low error. So when I click remove selected, then uh, I will get a very nice trend with 15 data points, our chemical in the middle, nicely on the trend, so I can accept the prediction at this point. And then we are back to the data matrix. I'm going to close this uh, workflow. Then we will uh, remain uh, with the, our target. OK, and there we see the, the prediction that was obtained. 67 uh, milligram per liter as LC50 fish and 96 hours for uh, Pimepales Promelias. Now, what is uh, very important to explain is that uh, 
whenever you have a prediction, okay, that's good, but still you have to check the report and then write something also eventually to convince then uh, regulators that uh, this uh, prediction uh, uh, is uh, really meaningful and uh, trustworthy. When you click on create the report, then there is a new wizard where uh, you can completely personalize your report. I'm going to leave the default options and later when looking at the report, I can explain uh, what is editable. When I click on create report, here uh, you don't only see the prediction report, which was the PDF file that now we have revamped and made it uh, easier to read, but you also have the data matrix in Excel. I will start by showing the uh, prediction report. It's a PDF. Before we had maybe 60 or 70 pages when making prediction with the toolbox for a simple report. Now we have 12. And the first page, it's already giving you the most important information. You have the target chemical, identifiers, predicted endpoint, predicted value, unit, data gap filling method, and the summary that I could have entered myself. One page, you got most of it. Second page, you start to see the trend, the defined endpoint, very important. Thomas has explained also why. What was the active descriptor, log KOW, the equation, well, what is the equation, what are the statistics related to it. And this is only the first two pages, one sheet of paper if you print both sides. And then if you want to see more, then there are more and more details on what has been done and uh, which were the profilers that were used, what was the descriptor used for your prediction, which were the databases. So we believe this is already a very big improvement compared to uh, before. Here there are even more uh, information about the analogs, but uh, even uh, nicer and newer is the data matrix in Excel. So automatic automatically generated by the toolbox. You have your target, you have the 14 analogs the toolbox has found as nice structures. You have the substance ID part. If you select uh, some parameters in this wizard, you can add, I don't know, low KOW, solubility, whatever property you may like to have. It tells you the profilers, so this very brief outcome on which properties are relevant for your substance. By default, it's giving you those used for the prediction. You can add more if you like. Then it's giving you all the experimental data points with the reference that were used for the prediction. And if you wish, you can add more endpoint. If for some reason, uh, other than a DLC 50, you want to see also the chronic data, other species, you just add it in the wizard and they, they will uh, appear here. So um, what I want to conclude by mm, telling you that uh, what is very important to us and what led us to this uh, development and improvements was uh, your feedback. We knew that people were often lost uh, when using the toolbox, uh, wondering which profiler I should use, which database I should use. Then we put the colors. People told us it takes too long to create uh, the data matrix in Excel and write a justification. Why can't it be faster? Now it's uh, there. We don't know the data quality in the databases, etc. Now there is an option for that. So we really appreciate your feedback, and whenever possible, we will implement it. Now it's time to give back the floor to Thomas, and uh, for any question, uh, you can just uh, yes ask uh, later. Thank you very much, Andrea. That was uh, it requires a bit of courage to show you live demo of the tool which was just released four hours ago. So please appreciate it. <laughs> and I hope that what you've seen, you like some new features and some new functionalities for those which uh, which were working with Toolbox uh, before. Uh, what I want to say at the conclusions is that um, Toolbox is not a magic box which will solve all your problems and fill your data gaps without any problems and any hassles. No, it's just we, we used to now we start to call it a decision supporting system for, for, for your hazard assessment. It allows you first to check whether or not the data are available somewhere in the public domain because we have the biggest collection of publicly available data in our databases. Then you can go to the sources, assess the quality, assess uh, mem uh, ownership of this data and conclude whether or not you can use it and how you can eventually use it. Then once you have this experimental data, you, we are giving you as well the tools 
and kind of similarity measures how you can group them to, together, how you can come up so, to some prediction, some or local trend, or uh, read across, or just build the data matrix because we don't have yet profilers for everything. Toolbox is not magic tool. We are not giving you to give you all toxicological explanations for all higher tier endpoints because we don't know them. We know only what we know, what is publicly available and what is developed and donated in the public uh, domain. And then, as you could see, you could do it everything in a very transparent manner. So for us, it's very, very important because then we can really follow it. So with that, I think I can, I can finish here. But before I will finish, uh, I want to, of course, thanks um, first for um, our colleagues in the for, from our contractors lab. As you see here, you have a logos of all the organizations which are actively participating in the development of the toolbox. So OECD and ECA as an owners, Laboratory of Mechanical Chemistry as a main developer of the toolbox, and then uh, two supporters, two subcontractors, which are John Moore University from Liverpool and Laza. And really, th this release was really as exceptional. Uh, this because we not only just uh, add those new features, we completely rebuilt the tools from scratch. We used completely everything was rewritten, everything was optimized to work on the newer computer, to work with the new uh, systems. It work. It requires much more work than than we planned at the beginning. So guys from our contractor lab were really working very hard to do it on time and I would really thank them for that. But of course, a toolbox wouldn't be possible without supporters, without those which are as well giving feedback, providing. So first we are getting the feedback from you, users. What do you think about toolbox, if it is good or not? Then we as well trying to combine it with our own experience, what is acceptable, what could be used, how it could be used. And the, the, so we, toolbox has a lot of supporters, so I would like to thank them as well. And with that, I would like to thank you. There is uh, one more information which I would like to, to, to give you that we are looking for your feedback on this on this training. So if you could go to sido.com and uh, type Evan as did and give us your feedback, this will be very appreciated. We'll know how to improve it for future and how even m better uh, suited to your needs. So with that, I would thank you very much for your attention. And I, th I think now we have a lunch break. Thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so I think we have still a few minutes for questions. So if you have any, of course, now there will be very difficult choice because you have to choose between lunch or questions, but please feel free to choose. <laughs> please. So, uh, ah, uh, if you could use the mic, then our co uh, people which are following us on on web they will hear as well the question yeah please so uh, as you increase the uh, level of automation there's obviously a bit of a balancing act between um, uh, the need for expert judgment but also making it easier for for the non-expert user um, I was wondering if you just say something about how certain more subjective decisions are made I noted um, the part about available databases, available um, profilers, you've got these three categories, uh, yes, no, and sort of plausible. Um, so perhaps say something about the, the plausible category and how that's, how that's mm -hmm. created. Um, and then also if you could just uh, say something about the concerns people might have about the, the quality of the data coming out at the other end. You know, if you were to then use a, a plausible profiler, um, you know, wh how's the regulator going to interpret that further down the line? Mm -hmm. Okay. How it happened that we have those two profilers, the, the two, t two workflows implemented at the moment, as I told you at the beginning, everything is gonna, uh, going through the OECD members uh, state uh, management group. So you need to convince them first that this is possible and this is something which we can try. We, did, we managed to convince them that for those two endpoints, for skin sensitization and for aquatic toxicity, we have more or less enough mechanistic understanding on what are the main mode of actions, how toxicity may develop and how what are the re relevant profiles give us enough confidence that we decided, okay, let's, let's, so basically what we did, we just implement the expert knowledge of, of the people which are developing the toolbox. 
into the tool. So you still need to be an expert. You need still to know what you want to predict for your substance. You need to still know your requirements. But at least you are not anymore. You don't need to really struggle with the specific choice of the databases, which you may not be the, the biggest you know, expert in. Or you don't need to struggle with what is the really some of those, for some cases, the selection, the, the, the order of the profilers is not super relevant. You can you can change this order as well. And in the standard in the standardized workflow, basically we are trying to give you these options. If you don't like outcome from automated workflow, you can always do it yourself. You have all, everything pre-cooked. You have pre-prepared those profilers which we believe are are the good ones for this particular endpoint. But you can decide on different on different uh, order. Uh, so, and what is the most important? It does everything automatically or semi-automatically, but all the documentation was has been done is still transparent. It's not the black box. You still know what toolbox did for you. You see it in the report and you see it during the workflow. So you know exactly what has been done. And each profiler has his own documentation. So you can know who developed it, what are the, the, the reasoning behind, what are the data supporting this profiler, what are the data supporting those chemicals classes. So at least the, all this evidence is still available to you, so you can judge whether or not you can trust this prediction. And and uh, as well, for us it's as well easier, because we as a regulators, we know at least that you followed something which we believe might happen for many chemicals. Please. Yeah. yeah. If uh, I may add, uh, so our aim is not to uh, make someone get exactly the same number. In that case, we will just have the automated workflow. We want uh, people to be able to get a reasonable prediction without investing months in learning the toolbox. Now, uh, if you choose a plausible profiler, which may be, let's say, organic functional group instead of US EPA chemical categories uh, rather than something else, in the end, if the selection uh, is uh, meaningful, the results are going to be almost the same. Not exactly the same, because, okay, one profiler can take one analog more or less, but more or less the same. If uh, you, as an expert, uh, find a way to get to completely different results by different choices, it means that at least one of the two, it's, it's wrong for, for some reason. Uh, hello, this is uh, Julia Furman from DHI Denmark. Uh, my question is, uh, at least in the previous version of Toolbox, uh, you have mentioned the importance of having a clear prediction. But I have been in a few uh, situations, for example, even the prediction as a graph looks uh, quite nice and clear and within the applicability domain. But when you look at the report, you know, there is also a section that says a level of confidence, but then comes up with a very low level of confidence, and I have never figured out <laughs> why, and I don't know if this is something uh, deal with in the new version or... Yeah. And, uh, yeah. yes. uh, the level of confidence is uh, calculated uh, on mathematical basis. So if you, you have a very low number of uh, data points, doesn't matter how close they are to the line, the confidence range is always going to be wide. It's mathematics. If you have a lot of data points, then this com even if they are not so nicely aligned, then the confidence range okay. as such will uh, decrease. Uh, we are not uh, taking uh, these numbers given by the toolbox and checking them uh, versus uh, you know a, um, threshold. Of course, if the whole range, which we know is wide, stays all nicely uh, above a classific uh, classification threshold, that's even nicer. But if in the confidence range, uh, one of the two ends of the range will be just a little bit borderline, and you can explain why you think this is too wide and it's too conservative, then yeah. it's okay. Because then there is a two case, right? One is that you can keep the graph a little bit more scattered, with more data, with higher confidence, or you can yeah. reduce the number of uh, data points in the prediction, and uh, yeah. then the graph looks very nice, but then the level of confidence is lower. So I, I cannot figure out which one is the better option. Well, uh, uh, of the course. The result is the same. Mm, yeah. 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 The confidence given by a big number of analogs, uh, it's something. That's why also the confidence yeah. range uh, becomes uh, narrower. Maybe you can take the prediction with uh, many analogs, show mm -hmm. how among these many analogs there are still some that are very close. You can highlight them, explain in the dossier mm -hmm. why these are more relevant, etc., and keep the one with many data points so that also for us, okay, if there are uh, 25 data points, uh, okay, maybe the quality of two or three data is so-so, but there are 20 as a backup, okay. that's very good. Is level of confidence still in the new version? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Please. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Helena Niemela from Borealis, and I would like to ask, First, first, I would like to thank you for a very interesting development. I think uh, there are very many good and interesting uh, 
properties um, that you have presented. And from the viewpoint of a registrant, I would like to, to hear whether ECA is uh, then accepting these reports as uh, generated by the tool, and also your views on which endpoints we can, we can use this tool. For example, can we replace some Annex 8 endpoints, some mm -hmm. testing requirements by these, um, these uh, predictions given by this tool? You want to take it or? Yeah. Okay, so thanks for the appreciation of the, the new version. If you have more suggestions, please just then email us because we really want to take them into account for future developments. So the automated workflows as such, so where you don't have to click almost anything, are for skin sensitization, Annex 7, and aquatic toxicity depending on the trophic level, Annex 7. Uh, oh, well, in the automated workflow, it's only for uh, fish. Uh, fish. Mm -hmm. So when you do the standardized workflow, you have a little bit of more trophic levels. And if you go to the manual prediction and still activate the color coding, then uh, you can have uh, uh, support for almost uh, any endpoint. Now, uh, regardless of the use of the automated workflow, a standardized workflow or classical way to predict, we would still like to see some reasoning on top of the report or manually edited in the report to explain why the prediction is uh, good or not. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, you can imagine that we don't want to say on, from our side that whatever uh, is uh, output of automated workflow of the toolbox is acceptable. We cannot say that. Of course, uh, we know what has happened. We know how well it performs. So we can be more confident when reading the documentation that nothing strange uh, has happened. So uh, please add the justification, but using that, uh, it certainly increases the chances because you have done choices that uh, we know have sense. Yeah, and maybe as well to add a bit on the what kind of endpoints we are. I, I think that basically, you know, all low tier endpoints when there is almost some kind of mechanical understanding and you see that they are in the toolbox profilers which are developed to support this then subcategorized by chemical similarity, or vice versa, first chemical similarity, then similarity, and then this endpoint specific profilers. We believe that for, for if you are in the zone which is data rich, you have a lot of analogs around which are quite, quite close, mm. you should be able to, 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 okay. to, to, be, to do the, the, the proper prediction which will be acceptable. This is our starting point, otherwise we wouldn't do it. Yeah. Thank you. Please. I think, Probably we can finish. I, I, I'm probably you are eager to, to go for lunch. So thank you very much once again for your attention and for your questions and have a nice rest of the day. Thank you.